Morning, church. It's nice to be back here again. Um, today I was given, uh, when I was asked to come uh, in fellowship with you today, I was given uh, an open topic. And, I said, and obviously that gives me great opportunity to, to dive into one of my greatest passion in, uh, in the Christian faith. Today, I'll be looking at the, uh, as the title says, Christianity through a worldview lens. So what do I mean by a worldview lens? The fundamental cognitive orientation or view of an individual or society involving the whole of the individual or society's knowledge, culture, and point of view. What does that mean, actually? Well, today we're going to take a look at how important a worldview perspective when it comes to our faith in our Christian walk. As individuals, every human being is governed by his own unique worldview. It what makes us different from one another. God has made us, each one of us, unique. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. And again in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. You, we are the clay, and you are the, our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Each and every one of us are presupposed by our own experiences. Even though we as Christians, as one family, are disposed by our own view of the world, even twins within the family are different in many ways. They may be physically the same, but and even the way they behave and act may be very similar, but they are uniquely different. We all know that. Some may like drinking tea in the morning. The other might like drinking coffee. These are presupposed values of an individual. And these values frame each and every one of us in our worldview. We are all different. And we also view the world differently. These worldviews that are presupposed in us because of the expressive nature of who we are. If we strongly believe in something, for example, maybe one of you have a joy of making cakes, and one of your ambitions that has driven your desire of cooking, for example, is to maybe one day open your own bakery shop or food shop. Some of you may love to read, and that desire within you may drive you one day to even open a little bookshop or a store uh, concentrating on books. We love certain values. And these presuppositions that are part of our worldview lens then bring people together. We see people who are driven, for example, who love to read. And then you see book clubs being organized. You're not, get a, you're not gonna get, get a person who hates reading to join a book club. It will never happen because these individuals are presupposed by their love and joy in reading. So these book clubs then propagate all over the place. Interestingly enough, these views from an individual then drive people to create different groups, which then lead to political parties. These values are either can, I, can either be intrinsically ours or intimate, but they can also expand as an existential expression of our values. Basically, you have a gathering of people. People of the birds of the same feather gather together. 
This is where we see how different worldviews have become part of society and have shaped society's values according to them. Political parties today exist based on individual worldviews. In our country, for example, which was founded on the fervor of self-rule against the British, began by individuals who created groups which then molded themselves into political parties that exist until today. Then you see a separate group that, create, that have propagated religious values to, to, to be incorporated within these political movements. And we see identity of individuals who are presupposed by these values whereby an individual is then has lost all basic intrinsic values whereby their religious beliefs versus their racial and, and ethnic background has then become one. There's no separation. This, in fact, is a subjective worldview that is imposed on individuals. Is that wrong? There's a great reason why I'm talking about this. Because when we look at the Christian faith, we must understand the difference between what faith represents in our lives. I mean, a philosopher once wrote, the most important presuppositions are the most basic and the most general beliefs about God, man, and the world and that anyone can have. Each and all, every one of us have a different uh, relationship in how we view the world. None of us are the same. Even though you have people who gather together with same values, for example, your book club, but one may not enjoy your political view about what's going on outside. And another may choose another view. So even within this concept of a person's worldview, we are then divided because of what? Because our individual values. Even science today, who make great epistemological, metaphysical, and ethical assumptions about the world, they assume, for example, that knowledge is possible and that sense experience is reliable. Epistemology. That the universe is irregular, unchanging. Metaphysics. And that scientists actually believe that they can be trusted and they are honest. Ethics. Without these assumptions that the scientists cannot justify within the limits of their methodology, scientific inquiry on their platform would collapse. Basic assumptions or presuppositions are important because of the way they often determine the method and goal of theoretic theoretical thought. They can be compared with, with like a car driving out on the road with no exit. Once people commit themselves to a certain set of presuppositions, their direction and destination doesn't change. An acceptance of the presuppositions, the Christian worldview, will lead a person to conclusions quite different from those who would follow a commitment to the presuppositions, for example, naturalism, or even Islam, or Buddhism, or Hinduism. Each religious belief, I use the word belief here, loosely, because each of them, when they follow these beliefs, are going down a certain road with no exit. It becomes part and parcel of who they are. They are framed within those worldviews. Even religious worldviews, though share some great, share great amount of metaphysical, epistemological, and ethical values, are still framed along many, many differences. 
We see how these factors amongst these worldviews, both religious and secular, has great influence on an individual and society. These same worldviews continue to shape the world today. The same problem has infected the Christian faith. It, is since, it has since the first church was established in Jerusalem, and it continues today to shape the Christian landscape. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the power, power of individual worldviews that has influenced the Christian church today. My brothers and sisters, look at the West. Look at the so-called bastion of Christian faith. We see the explosion of ideologies of individuals whose individual freedoms have dictated the downfall of the Christian value. Gays, lesbians have existed since the early Bible and has been deplored and has always been punished. In Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, which is part of the law, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And right into the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor idolaters, ad adulterers, nor men who, are who practice homosexuality? Then why do so many churches today condone such practices? Because these churches are governed by their own worldviews. They disregard the laws of God and justify their behavior by quoting the one foundational essence of the Christian faith. My brothers and sisters, do you know what that is? This, it is love. They succumb not because they do not see the law, but because they justify their behavior by actually using the one foundational principle of their faith, which is love. This is the very nature and the character of man. When our worldviews justify sin by using the very nature of God to do it, When the despised sinners and adulterers, fornicators, but we do not indulge that behavior by allowing it to propagate and expand in the church. We know that. It is foundational. The problem with these people and churches is that that justification of the word love is not the love that they view. The, the love that is of God is the agape love of God. In John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The word love here is agape, the sacrificial love of God. We as Christians are called to expose these sins and help those who commit them to denounce them because of the agape love of God. For example, my brothers and sisters, if you see someone that you care and love for, and you've known for years, and all of a sudden you see him indulging in heavy drinking, as he drinks and drinks and drinks, or a member of your family goes down that road, for whatever reason, you're not going to stop him? Are you just quietly going to watch and stand by as this person indulges in this horrific practice and end up probably in hospital or even worse, we immediately step in. We immediately voice our concerns. We immediately show the love of God. It can be anyone that you see. And this is the expression of the Christian faith that we are supposed to carry outside the church. Worldviews are powerful. They can be used to destroy as well as to build. The devil has tried so many paths to lure humanity into the pit of hell. 
Now the devil uses the very nature of man to lead him to hell. Our worldviews are important, and where we place them is foundational in our faith. Now that we have a very basic understanding of worldviews, let's dive in deeper. The, the one key element that will differ, differentiate worldviews is based on their values and is to understand those values and place them against what we call the absolute truth. From the point of view of a standard that's for, for, for Christians, the absolute truth is the word of God. But how we view them is our objective truth because we apply it in our lives. We as Christians look to the word of God and its teachings as the absolute truth. We believe in them and make it part of our lives. In Galatians chapter 2, 2 20, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And Jesus himself said in John chapter 12, verse 24 to 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls onto the earth and dies and remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. However, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. I'm sure all of you take this passages from the Bible, and it becomes our foundational, our objective truth. We believe in it. It is part of our nature. The gospel in itself for Christians is part of who we become. I have been crucified with Christ. If a grain of wheat is just placed on the soil, as Jesus says, it will indeed not die. But it will then, it, it, then itself remain alone and produce nothing. So will the Son of Man remain alone if he does not stoop to death on the cross. But if the grain falls into the earth, dies and is consumed, it changes, it becomes a plant and it grows and brings forth much fruit. So the Son of Man, God incarnate Son, by dying will produce millions of children for God, of God. Fruit in the most glorious abundance. Famous scholar, and many of you know, a theologian Augustine of Hippo said, the death of Christ was the death of the most fertile grain of wheat. He was the perfect seed. In Jesus' death, we see the rebirth of the Son of Man and the Son of God, bringing the divide between us sinners and the perfect God. This is the worldview that we Christians believe, and it becomes our objective truth. Because it is the absolute truth. However, we see many Christian denominations that view and interpret scripture differently. Only the denominations that hold Christ central and the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are walking in the presence of the absolute truth in their lives. However, as individuals, we Christians, even as we hold on to the fundamental truths of the Word of God, are subjected to life experiences that dictate our worldviews. How we perceive the world around us and how we react to these subjective influences 
Subjective means out of us. Objective means part of us. We are not immune to these influences outside of us. We all have our own choices. I'm sure after this session, uh, worship today, some of you will be walking to certain restaurants because that's your favorite food. I'll walk to one restaurant because that's the only restaurant I know how to order. So I'm comfortable there. Though I know I would love to go to other restaurants. We are all presupposed. We would immediately go somewhere to seek something that we like. And obviously, you make that choice. And what do you do next? You find someone to follow you with the same interests. The Christian worldview calls us to fo focus on only one person, Jesus Christ. And this is the absolute truth of the gospel. That is the evidential proof that Jesus Christ is in his historical manifestation as obviously the Son of God in flesh. These are written, and the gospel testifies to it, that ye may believe that Jesus is the, is the Christ, the Son of God, as written in John chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by, belie by believing you may have life in his name. And that Jesus came as a man, as John the Baptist proclaimed in John chapter 1, verse 30. This is he of, of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. And he was thoroughly known in his human origin, as written in John chapter 7, verse 27. But we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. Confess himself as human, as man. And in John chapter 8, verse 40, But now you seek to kill me, a man, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. And this is not what Abraham did. And finally, he died as a man, just like any one of us would die. In John chapter 19, verse 5, for, So Christ came out wearing the crown of thorns and purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. All this, nevertheless, not only the Messiah, the sent of God, the fulfiller of all the divine promises of redemption for us, but also the very Son of God that God only begotten, who abiding in the bosom of the Father is his sole adequate interpreter for our lives. From the beginning of the gospel onward, this purpose reveals these absolute truths. If these truths are not the fundamental platform that undergrades our faith, then you are not following the absolute truths of, of the facts and evidence of who Jesus Christ is. My brothers and sisters, we can talk about it all the time. And I can stand here and preach the same thing every week. It all comes down to, to the person sitting there who's listening. And how does that work? It all comes down to the million dollar word, faith. Many non-believers view the Christian worldview as a blind leading the blind. They use the greatest example of the Bible of Abraham and Isaac to prove this point. God told Abraham to do the unthinkable, to kill Isaac in Genesis chapter 22, verse one to 19. And when Abraham received this order, Abraham did not question God. Upon receiving the order, Abraham did not even bring up the question or deny God's instruction. Is this blind faith? I talk to a lot of non-believers, atheists, other religious practices, and this is brought up. Then they tell me, 
you guys just blindly believe in whatever is told to you. Whatever Sunday you come here and listen to the person on the pulpit who's yakking away. And you go back and 90% of us will just forget what he said. And I bring this up, Abraham. Because this has been used against Christians. Abraham being the example of blind faith. And you know, at the end, God stopped him. And what did God say? Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. This account makes it seem that God was rewarding and complimenting Abraham for his blind faith. And since Abraham is the one of the models given for us to follow, it may seem like such a great example for Christians today to just follow blindly. But if you go to Hebrews chapter 11 and read through it, it's often, it's, it's used and often called the, the hall of faith, of fame, hall of fame of faith. In it, you find many of the greatest people of the Bible and their accomplishments through faith. And when you read onwards, you see that Abraham is listed as more than once in those verses. And but in, chapter, in verses 18 and 19, tells us that Abraham reasoned. He reasoned. He used his head. And he reasoned that God had promised a great nation through Isaac. And that even if Isaac was, was killed, God would bring Isaac back from the dead. And because of this reasoning, this is not blind faith. Abraham followed with the command. Abraham did not act blindly. He used his own faculties of reasoning and understanding to his own objective truths and what God represents in his life. This is going to be very important was the end of this sermon. I don't want you to remember it. Abraham knew that God's nature is a faithful God and remembered God's promise regarding Isaac. And Abraham acted accordingly. Throughout scripture, you find that reason, wisdom, logic are lifted up as good traits. For example, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13, says that we are blessed when we find knowledge and understanding. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 and 14, corrects teachers for not learning and growing in understanding. Paul commends the church in Berea because they search the scripture daily to see if what Paul has said was true in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. In many places throughout the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul was used, was said to reason with the lost, attempting to prove to them the truths of his word. In James chapter 1, verse 5, he even tells us to ask God for wisdom, which he gives generously to all without finding fault. There are many other places where Reason and understanding are uplifted. To state the point simply, God created humans with the ability to think and reason. And God expects us to use that gift he has given us. Remember that at, at its core, the goal of reason and logic is to find the truth. And Jesus made the bold claim that he is truth. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So reason and logic should lead us to Jesus every time. We are expected to act in faith on God's promises, just as Abraham did. But we do that from a position of trust based on all the knowledge that we have of God. 
Abraham followed God's order based on his faith, that God would keep his promise to raise up a nation through Isaac. Abraham had learned that God would keep his promises through a lifetime of walking with God. So this was the reason and informed faith. This will be, there will be times in our walk as Christians that we will unconsciously and just act purely on faith because we do not have the whole picture just as Abraham did. However, this faith is not blind. It is based on knowledge of God's nature and character, his promises in the scripture and our personal experience in walking with God every day. What happens when we compare the Christian worldview against other worldviews? Look at every other worldview today. Show me one that allows you to objectively seek and reason based on its truth claims. Show me one. Look at the two major religious faiths closely related to the Christian worldview. Its teachings are subjective and overwhelming and call for complete submission to its subjective truth. Look at the Jewish teachings today. And this is a lifelong lifestyle of tradition that dictates an individual's faith. Every practice has become a tradition within a believer's life. They do it because they have been doing it all their lives. The other major worldview, too, has the same traditions that culminate in its teachings that envelop an indiv individual's life. And an individual's intrinsic values, which is recognized from our worldview, is replaced by teachings that refute the freedom of the human values, of our human values and nature, inherited from God. For example, the Jews celebrate celebrations year-round. They got Yom Kippur, Shabbat, Hanukkah, Passover, and many more. And we also know the other religious worldview has a whole list of festivals that we enjoy as holidays in our country. <laughs> we, we know them all very well. Interestingly enough, look at what has become of the Christian worldview. The Christian worldview in itself has developed its own celebrations. Now I ask you one quick question. Anyone here, and you can come up to me after uh, worship today, where in the Bible does it call us to celebrate anything in the New Testament? Where? Show me. Show me where Christmas is. Even Good Friday. You may argue the Lord's Supper, but look at the churches. Some churches, Catholicism celebrates it every Sunday. Certain churches celebrate it the first of every month. Some even twice a month. You serious? If you go to the Last Supper, and read exactly what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The verses before that talk about how we as Christians enjoy the life we have. We eat, we, we drink. It's part of our life. It's presupposed. Immediately after he talks about it, he goes to the Lord's Supper. What is he telling you? That every time you sit down and eat, do you remember? Do we do that? Is that being practiced in the church? Is it being proclaimed? No, we need to make it a celebration in the church. I'm going to get a lot of feedback from this. My brothers and sisters, this is the problem of worldviews. And the greatest example is Christmas. I mean, 
Some of us here may argue that the Christian worldview is the same like the other religions. See, this is the difference. It is not. The Christian worldview is not based on tradition, but a heritage. We, as Christians, have turned that heritage into a tradition. Traditions are developed by man and passed down through the centuries. Listen very carefully what I'm about to say. But a heritage, a heritage, it is an inheritance. It belongs to each and every one of us here. It is the revelation of God's plan since creation that his creation that was created in his image and likeness inherits the purpose of his creation of us. That we are able to come into relationship with our creator. Whereas tradition is a repetitive order of action that is void of any reason or purpose apart from a subjective instruction. They do it because they are told to do it. And since most followers of these two major other worldviews, including the many churches today, are indoctrinated with these lifestyles, the very nature and essence of who they are is embedded in their religious practices. You notice I've included Christianity, Judaism, and Islam together. But the Bible is, is a story of our inheritance. It is a gift from God that he seeks in our relationship. We have taken it and abused it for our own worldviews. Let me close with this. The Bible is, the word of God is the universal platform that's anchored in the absolute truth. The unchanging, unwavering truth of who Christ is and how we as Christians live under, this, under the new covenant. The laws of the Bible don't apply exclusively to Christians. It applies to every living person on earth. Do you realize that? Jesus dying is a gift from God to all humanity. The only difference is some believe, some don't. Some will be saved, some won't. So the values and the characteristics and the moral and ethical teachings of the Bible doesn't apply just within the church. We are to live it out. And Jesus gave warnings about this. Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy? And what did Jesus say? You know. We must be aware of our own objective truths that govern our own worldview lens. I cannot stand up here and start teaching you how to do. I don't know. Some of us are wearing glasses. I don't know what your power in the lens is. You are the only one that needs to find out. You are the only one that needs to sit down and ask yourself what in my life that presupposes my faith with God? What are those truths? Are they holding me back? Are they, they are, is it not giving me the full assurances of my faith? Not blind faith. Of my faith that governs my walk every day? We need to do it individually. We need to pray over it. 
We need to ask God to reveal it to us. Many of us suffer and it's part of who we are. We are stressed by all the conditions of our lives. And sometimes we don't know why. And we ask God. And as Christians, we should come together and pray. Do you have a prayer group outside the church that anybody can, can just send a message, pray for me for this, pray for me to, for that? The reason why I bring this up, and this is how great God is. I've been struggling spiritually where God is leading me. And I've been praying on my own. Last month, I have an Instagram account with 74 followers. And through this turmoil in me, I saw this post of a a man screaming out to God. And I posted it. I reposted it. I got 8 million views. Today, this morning, I got 79,000 followers in one month. Not by my work. God is telling me, people are suffering out there. We need to come together as a church. We need to pray for each other. We need to help fellow Christians to go through this turmoil and helping them to identify these problems that presupposes their faith. That is what it means to be a church. We need to become better understanding of who, what, and why we exist. We need to understand our own worldviews. We need to become increasingly aware of other people's worldview. Your fellow Christians. As well as non-believers. As well as other religious and non-religious worldviews. That is what it means to love as a Christian. But the only way to do that, and listen to what Jesus says, love God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And love what? As your you don't know yourself, how are you even going to know God, let alone your neighbor? Let me close with prayer. Heavenly Father, help us to go through our hearts to identify the hurdles that and the challenges that we have already faced. Sometimes these cause fears in us and it causes us to hold ourselves back as Christians. It influences our worldview. It denies us the full message and the glory of walking in your path. Father, we here are desirous of your wisdom and your guidance and more importantly, the presence of the Holy Spirit to help us to go through this. Ultimately, to become better Christians, to love you, Father, to love our neighbors, Father, by first starting to love ourselves. We ask and pray this through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.